had to remake this. This poll is only for those who think xenogenders are valid. Everyone else, please hit C results. Are there any genders which are not valid? If yes, please explain your criteria for them below. Yes, no, results. And this truly is a question that has been plaguing liberals on Twitch.tv for at least like a week back in December. Are all genders valid? Or as Hans puts it, are there any genders which are not valid? Seems like a fair question these days as all those wily non-binaries are expanding the answer to the question, what is gender? So if we accept that xenogenders and neo-pronouns are valid, where's the limit? Are all genders valid? To explore this, we have to go to the far reaches of fake trans people we made up to get mad at. Is gamer a gender? What about helicopter? Can you be Nazi gender? And if there's no line, then that means we do have to like bite the bullet and say that we're okay with the ex existence of say Nazi gender. And I'm gonna be honest with you, as much as I hate the particular examples that always come up, this is actually a reasonable method of disproving an all statement. If I said all apples are red, all you have to do is show me a green apple and boom, I'm proven wrong. Or if I said all prime numbers are odd, all you have to do is show me the number two and that's right, baby, it's a math video. To explore the idea of all genders, I think it's useful to first explore the idea of all numbers. I like to think of sets of numbers in terms of their operation. Start with the most basic mathematical operation, counting. And you get counting numbers, also known as whole numbers, also known as natural numbers. You can add these numbers, multiply them, even take exponents, and you'll still be within the natural numbers. But when you start to subtract, you have to deal with zero and negatives. That's how we get our integers. So we've got addition, multiplication, subtraction, and if we start to divide, we get our rational numbers. Rational numbers are any number that can be represented as a fraction or a ratio of two integers, except the bottom one can't be zero. You can't divide by zero. Then we introduce roots, like the square root, and now we're into algebraic numbers. The technical definition is any number that is the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients. Or just think of it as all the numbers that you could write as the solution to a nice, neat algebra equation. And there are some familiar faces in here, like the square root of 2 or phi, the golden ratio, even i, the square root of negative 1. But it's when we zoom out a little further that we get into the fun stuff. Ever heard of a little number called pi? Pi is transcendental. It transcends your mortal understanding of maths. Actually, it just transcends algebra. You cannot create pi in algebra. You can use it, certainly, but there's no equation that gives you the value of pi. And Euler's number, which is equal to this, sum from zero to infinity of one over n factorial. That ain't algebra. And there's one more useful boundary here. Computable numbers, pi, Euler's number, the natural log of two. We can't get these through algebra, but we can get them through computers. We could run this sum through computer code, and given enough time, it would spit out the infinitely many digits of E. But outside of the computable numbers are where things get dark. These are numbers we can't even compute. The only way to construct them is to write out every single digit. And remember, we're in irrational territory, so the digits can never repeat, and they can never end. Now, are you sitting down? This is almost all numbers. And I mean that in a mathematical sense. Every number you've ever seen, 1, 2, 3, pi, the square root of 2, those are a statistically insignificant subset of what numbers actually are. Think of any number you want. It's computable. And yet, mathematically speaking, almost no numbers are computable. Your feeble mortal mind can only comprehend a fraction of a percent of a shadow of what numbers are. 
But you're not here for math. You're here because I opened the video with this. Are there any genders which are not valid? And I'm going to borrow a page from our favorite debate bros, broads, and brigadiers and try to formalize an unquantifiable part of the human experience. So let's start here with he and she. These are the first genders we learn as kids. Mama, dada, you know the deal. Okay, also for this section, I'm going to be using pronouns and gender kind of interchangeably, but the idea here is that pronouns are symbols which can convey information about a person's gender much in the same way that numbers are symbols for mathematical quantities. So he and she, let's call these the binary genders. And then outside of that, you probably learn about they, thems, and it, its. And hearing these as gender pronouns may be new, but the words themselves are some of the first we learn. So let's call these the standard written English genders. And then we get into less familiar territory, depending on who you are. We got Z's and Zim's, both with an X and with a Z. We can put our phase in here. These are our neo-pronouns, which means this is the edge of pronouns. And past this, we get into xenogenders. Now, I'm fairly new to xenogenders, but here is my rudimentary understanding. Xenogenders are a niche subset of non-binary identities which use non-human elements as reference for their gender identity. The usual examples are tree gender, star gender, and yes, deer gender. Now, before you jump down the throat of like 15 teenagers on Tumblr, I don't think this is as unusual as people try to make it seem. People who identify with xenogenders don't literally believe they're a deer or a tree or a star. Maybe they believe they're not human, but that's not biological denialism as much as it sounds. It's really just an exploration of the question, what is human? And I think that answer can be more complex than just a member of the species Homo sapiens. But no one thinks they're really a tree, and if they do, well, that's kind of outside the scope of this video. But someone who identifies with tree gender might believe that their gender can be described as unchanging, organic, nurturing. A person who is star gender might describe their gender as bright, unique, or awe-inspiring. A person who is deer gender could describe their gender as playful, pastoral, or just cute. And the typical response is, well, those are just personality traits, not gender. And I, I don't even necessarily disagree. But think about how we are taught about men and women. Men are protectors and providers. They're emotionally tough. They're disagreeable. All the really disagreeable people are men. And women are nurturers and caretakers. They're beautiful and precious, and they're worth protecting just because. Even the most basic, traditional, heteronormative traits associated with men and women really have nothing at all to do with gender. I could show you a whole list of non-human images and I'm pretty sure you'd be able to guess if I was describing a man or a woman. And you're gonna tell me the least understandable example I just showed was tree? Like, there's a pretty good argument to be made that xenogenders are actually more linguistically useful than the binary genders. They're certainly more specific, just like the further reaches of numbers. And like these more obscure numbers, it's probably pretty hard to wrap your head around certain concepts of gender. But those uncomputable numbers are still numbers. And these xenogenders are just as valid as man and woman. How big is a circle? No, seriously, how big of an angle does it take to make a circle? If you said 360 degrees, you're right. But where does 360 come from? Honestly, it's, it's such an old convention that we actually don't know for sure. Maybe because in some ancient calendars there were 360 days. 
Maybe because you can divide it by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 18, 20, 24, 30, 36, 40, 45, 60, 72, 120, or 180. But maybe you answered that a circle measures 2 pi. 360 is useful, sure, but it's still somewhat arbitrary. 2 pi is much less arbitrary. It comes from the circumference of a circle with radius 1. And because it's in terms of pi, it's much easier to relate to other properties of a circle, like arc length, area, diameter, you name it. The sine of pi is 0, and the cosine of pi is negative 1. It all just kind of falls into place. Mathematicians like to standardize mathematical concepts in a way that could be readily understood by an alien species. I mean, there's not a rule about aliens, but the more organic we can make standards, the better. Heck, our first group of numbers is called natural numbers, remember? But one thing I didn't really touch on when we were looking at our numbers was that these lines are arbitrary. I mean, they're well established, don't get me wrong, but there's an infinite number of ways to draw these lines. I chose to include zero as an integer rather than a whole number. I included negatives pretty early on, which doesn't always have to be the case. Uh, I wasn't going to put negatives on this diagram, so I regret that. This whole sheet of paper is just going to be the reals. Positive reals. You know what? It works for negative reals. What am I saying? Have the negatives. It's fine. And I included complex numbers within my algebraic numbers, which, again, we often teach these as their own disjointed set. And this is with math something that's supposed to be rigid and unchangeable and rules-based. Well, I hate to break it to you, but math is literally incomplete. We've known this for a fact since 1931. Maybe I'll do a video on that in the future, but it's too much of a tangent for now. Get it? Tangent? And if math is incomplete, what the heck are we supposed to know about gender? Now, in addition to the lines being arbitrary, we're introducing the concept of fuzziness meaning sometimes a gender may not belong entirely to a single set. We know that negative 3 is an integer and not a natural number, but it's much harder to make these declarations about gender. Is it a neo-pronoun? How do we handle pronoun phrases like that one? It's standard English, but it's so uncommon that it feels like something new. And just like in math, where we can't say exactly where every single number goes, we don't know for sure where every gender belongs. So how the heck are we supposed to answer a question like, are all genders valid? There's one more set of numbers that I haven't introduced yet. Normal numbers. Normal numbers are numbers where you can expect every possible string of digits to appear in its decimal. You can find your phone number in there, your name, even the complete unabridged works of Dave Chappelle, assuming they were translated into decimal code, which admittedly might be weird for Dave since decimal is not binary. Now, we know a few normal numbers, but they're completely fabricated. The easiest one to understand is the Champernoun constant, which is equal to 0 0.1234567891011. and so on. But because that number is generated using a specific rule, it's still within the computable numbers. So remember how I said almost all numbers are uncomputable? Well, most of those numbers are normal, and we haven't proven a single one. I was going to end the video with a line about xenogenders being normal, but it felt like a bit of a weak conclusion, not least because it kind of undermines the whole mathematical message of the video. Normal numbers are normal because their digits are distributed normally. And statistically, they are normal. If you pick any number in the world at random, it would be normal. But the problem with xenogenders is that they are exceedingly rare. For reference, we have evidence that 80 people are cat gender, and that's a lot for any given xenogender. And because xenogenders are so uncommon, there's a popular political argument that they shouldn't be respected, the idea being that advocating for such identities will only further alienate transgender people at large. Well, 
I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news lately, but it's not xenogenders that trans people have to be worried about. It's actually overreaching anti-trans state governments that are the problem. And our online discussions about star genders aren't going to push the needle much on should trans children be removed from their parents' custody. But beyond that, we can challenge the notion that xenogenders are rare. Sure, most people aren't rock gender, but most people aren't Dwayne the Rock Johnson gender either. Even within the binary genders, there's a spectrum of men and a spectrum of women. Because even the most cisgender binary man or woman has a unique and personal relationship with their gender. Just like they have a unique identity and perspective and experience. So this inner circle, rather than just two elements, actually has billions. And by that notion, once we've blurred our lines, xenogenders are exactly as normal as any other gender. And yes, just as valid.